Let me welcome everybody. I'm delighted to see so many of you here today to discuss wonderfully deep and important topic with a fantastic guest. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the Future Transforms creator, host, and chief cat herder, and I'll be your guide to the next hour of conversation. Uh, I am absolutely delighted uh, to be able to welcome Richard Aram. Richard is a professor and a dean at UC Irvine. He's the author of one of the most important and controversial books published in the 21st century about higher education, Academically Adrift. He has been researching and exploring how to measure and think about student learning. And most recently, he is finishing what I believe is the first phase of the Next Generation Undergraduate Success Measurement Project. If you'd like to learn more about that, well, we're gonna be doing it together. But in the bottom left corner of your screen, you should see a kind of yellow or tan colored button just press that button and up will pop the home page of that program. Now, let me welcome Professor Aaron and bring him on stage. Greetings. Thank you, Brian. Uh, uh, really grateful for all the work you're doing with this forum in general and for inviting me uh, onto it uh, in particular today. Well, thank you. It's, it's an honor. And just so you know, you're carrying a noble uh, forum tradition forward, which is hosting guests with good beards. That's an, an, an <laughs> thing to do. Uh, uh, we, we ask people to introduce themselves uh, using a particular method. Uh, I'd like to ask you what you're going to be working on for the rest of this year. What's the, what are the big projects or the big ideas that are going to be top of mind and soaking up most of your time? That's great. Great question. Yeah. So there's uh, 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 just to be complete. There's two projects I'm working on at uh, currently. Uh, one is on uh, a local project in Orange County. Uh, how do we help uh, educators and social service agencies better serve foster youth and housing insecure youth? Mm. I'll set that aside. It's uh, it's wow. it's really. Uh, 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 not higher ed focused, but the other project that is my primary project, one we'll talk about today, the Next Generation Undergraduate Success Measurement Project that was uh, funded by the Mellon Foundation to uh, set up a state-of-the-art uh, uh, measurement system to track undergraduate experiences, outcomes, and trajectories in a much more holistic comprehensive manner than kind of the existing measurement that's occurring in the sector. Which is the, the, one of the main reasons I wanted to bring you here today to dive into that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, happy to jump in and un, un, uh, uh, explain some of the, the project goals, uh, the, uh, the way we're going about the measurement work, um, uh, the, our uh, holistic framework for thinking about student success, and uh, and then you also share some findings today uh, from this project that we can kind of learn from and help inform uh, policy and practice moving forward. Fantastic, I, I, friends! I have a couple of very very quick questions to get the ball rolling, but the purpose of the forum is to be a platform for your own questions and comments. So again, just look in the bottom of the screen and press that raised hand button if you want to join us on stage, bearded or not, you're all welcome. Or just type in the question mark and type in your question or comment. Um, one quick question to start off with is, where are you in the in the process? Now, I was trying to guess that you'd finished a first phase, and that's a very yeah. easy attempt. So uh, we are, uh, let's see now, we are 18, almost 18 months into data collection. Mm. Uh, we're uh, just about to launch the second set of uh, uh, these innovative performance assessments uh, we developed. So to measure growth in uh, some competencies uh, we think are aligned with uh, 21st century workforce needs and liberal arts education values. Um, so uh, let me uh, share, since we started talking about the performance assessments, let me talk about that. And then let's just put a, put a little flag in the conversation that we're 18 months into this. That means we started data, data collection before the pandemic mm -hmm. and also have this kind of unique opportunity, you know, by uh, unfortunate accident 
-hmm. to kind of understand the effects of the pandemic and moving to remote instruction on the lives uh, of undergraduate students and, and outcomes uh, uh, as well. But let me say, since we started talking about the performance assessments, that's one of, of many different data streams we're using in this project. But, but since I mentioned it, let me uh, uh, ex explain a little bit what we did there. So we had uh, the good fortune of partnering with uh, ETS, the, the big assessment firm, uh, to not just use their off-the-shelf standardized assessment items, but they were so interested and excited about our project that they partnered with us to co-design new assessments that we thought were better aligned with the goals ahead. So we did use their off-the-shelf uh, measure of critical thinking. It's called uh, the heightened assessment. It's a commercial product. It could be used by anyone. But then we designed uh, a suite of other performance tasks for students to undertake. Uh, first, we designed a collaborative problem solving task for students to engage in. Four students are put into a virtual space. They're given a set of documents to uh, uh, examine. Mm -hmm. they, so they solve the problem first individually. Then they're given an opportunity to interact with each other mm -hmm. to share information from the documents they have and solve the problem again after the collaboration. Mm -hmm. We're able to observe the, the actual collaborative process as well as the, the uh, uh, extent to which the collaborative problem solving result at the end is, is, is uh, uh, aligned with um, the, 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 the uh, desirable outcomes. So collaborative problem solving, we also very interested in perspective taking. Can students develop the competency to uh, um, take the perspective of someone different than themselves. So they're given these scenarios, complex social scenarios, where they're asked to take the perspective of uh, diverse social actors in, in the scenario. We're also very interested in the 21st century at this historic moment around collaborative, uh, sorry, around confirmation bias. Mm. Will individuals change their opinion when new information is presented to them? And so we have a confirmation bias task to, to, to assess the student's ability to change their opinion when new information is provided. And mm. finally, we partnered with Sam Weinberg uh, at Stanford, uh, a history project at Stanford. He's doing excellent work on online civic reasoning. Mm. Students are given uh, something that they might see in Twitter, Facebook, social media, are they able to make sense of it and determine the reliability and validity of the data? And so again, we did these initially with students in fall 2019. We're gonna assess them again on these competencies in spring 2021 and in, in next month. And then we did a whole lot of other data collection other than these performance assessments uh, as well, and I'm happy to talk about that. Those other strands as well. Well, this this is great. Uh, collaborative problem solving, taking other perspective, online civic reasoning, grappling with confirmation bias, and this is that's just one set of of, of what you all yes. need. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, tell us about a couple of the other strands. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. so, so we've got um, uh, uh, one strand. We uh, uh, the project we call did you see the administrative data strand that has all the you can think of it as the conventional data that uh, uh, colleges and universities often routinely collect, uh, course taking, uh, grades, credit accumulation, choice of major, uh, the college admissions data. Uh, so we have some background information on them. And then uh, some other administrative data that some universities like Georgia Tech and others uh, make use of, others don't. Uh, uh, data on what, uh, when and where students are interacting with student support services, mm. when they, when they uh, engage an academic advisor, when they engage in tutoring services, 
when they uh, uh, enga engaged with the career service office uh, and so on, so on and so forth. And so we also integrate all this administrative data into our project. That's uh, again, uh, the administrative data st strand. We also make use of something um, that uh, is kind of rare in higher education, but it's, a, I believe, an incredible opportunity. Yeah. We make use of data generated in the learning management systems. Mm -hmm. So today, everyone you know is, is interacting uh, um, through these systems. Uh, Canvas uh, is one of them. Blackboard. Uh, there, there's uh, there's a few a, a few different ones, but. Uh, much of the interaction between student and faculty are increasingly mediated by these learning management systems. That was true before the pandemic, obviously even more so since. And so what we've been able to do with that data is generate academic engagement measures for every student in every course at UCI. Wow. How many hours they're spending in the course, how on, online, uh, how many times they go on the site to access materials, uh, the extent to which they interact with faculty on those sites and they interact with peers on those sites. Uh, we also have access to, to products that they uh, deposit there. So you get again, a, uh, an authentic way to measure how students are engaging in the academic enterprise. And, and we, we use that data to integrate it into this measurement system. And then the, the, the third and final strand is uh, extensive uh, survey, uh, uh, oh. survey methods and experiential sampling. And so the, um, the administrative data, the LMS data, we look at for all undergraduate students there's a 1,200 students in a cohort, freshmen and juniors, we take on each year. And for those students, they get the performance assessments and they also get extensive surveys. Those 1,200 students will receive eight surveys uh, over the course of each year, uh, a background survey about their orientation, their goals, their values starting college, but then also at the end of each term, how they're experiencing their classes and what's occurred in their classes in terms of the type of instruction they've received, uh, as well as, again, their, their goals and how their goals are evolving over time. A subset of a, of a third of those students, they get even more surveys. They, for, for those students, they get weekly surveys and also, uh, um, two weeks during the year, we do experiential sampling with them where they get buzzed on their phone. What are you doing? Who are you doing it with? And what's your emotional state? Uh, and so we've got this very fine grained detailed data on how stu what students lived experiences are at our college uh, uh, at, at UCI. And this is from everything from their interaction with their peers, which is key to the holistic development you would want on a college campus, to experiences of discrimination and microaggression. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, 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 we do our best to capture the full range of student uh, experiences, and we do it for the following reason. Mm -hmm. If, if you, we are serious about serving our students well, mm -hmm. We have to understand in a broad, holistic, comprehensive framework how they're experiencing mm -hmm. undergraduate life, how that how these experiences track with outcomes and their trajectory. We can't intentionally design without that. We can do it on the basis of ideology and hunches and mm -hmm. you know so on. But that's not you know every other industry in the world today uses data to better and intentionally design how they interact with 
the 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 clients the the they serve the consumers the customers yeah. or if if they if if netflix does it my gosh in higher education where we have something much more serious in our charge yes the responsibility of 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 uh supporting student growth and development to face the the incredible challenges that we're going that we're facing in society moving forward the environmental crisis the current public health crisis the political polarization in our country my gosh do we have a, a responsibility and a need to figure out how to best serve students to so that they are developing and in a way that they'll be prepared to meet those challenges that's a very, very stirring call. And by God, that's an enormous amount of research being done. Um, I, I've never heard of anything anywhere near the scale. Uh, this is true. But, but let me let me get out of the way. Uh, thank you for giving us that introduction, the rest of the, to the to the work. And again, remember, everybody on the bottom left of the screen, there's a, uh, a button which will take you to the website for the project. But I wanted to share some of the questions that have come up so far. And again, invite you all uh, to add your own questions and thoughts. As you can tell, Professor Aram is, is definitely happy to, uh, uh, to share with you. Um, so to begin with, we have a question from um, Paul Walsh at USM. Does the project give students a live trending outlook so students can see how they are progressing in relation to their efforts and to previous students? Yeah, that's a, gr it's a great uh, 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 question, Paul. So one, one way to use kind of data like this is to personalize instruction and to use the data to feedback to students so that they can better understand and uh, uh, take ownership of their own growth. Mm -hmm. uh, those are things we might aspire to get to down the road. It's not something we uh, had uh, the resources or ability to build into the system uh, at the current stage of the project. Uh, you know, we are, our goal is let's collect this data so that we can inform institutional improvement efforts, continuous institutional improvement efforts, as well as use this data so that the educational research community, the social scientific research community can better understand the value of liberal arts education broadly conceived and also uh, uh, identify what's what works and what doesn't work in terms of these underlying educational processes. So this data that we're collecting, it's going to be de-identified and deposited at the University of Michigan in a data archive, ICPSR, mm -hmm. for, the, for the larger social scientific community to make sense of. Let me say one more thing about that, because because if you've been reading the newspapers recently, Biden's talking about infrastructure. Let me tell you what the most important infrastructure we need in this country today is. Hmm. We need infrastructure about how to deliver, measure, iterate and improve higher education. I can think of no greater infrastructure need than that because individuals alone can't do this. We need to build the, the infrastructure so that we can improve higher education, not just to do better by the students we currently serve, but to increase access dramatically so that our country is prepared to meet the, the challenges we're gonna face going forward. And, you know, uh, uh, shame on us in this sector if we aren't articulating that need to leaders in Washington and demanding that these kinds of investments get made. Well said. Well said. Paul, thank you for the great question. And, and Richard, thank you for the uh, multi-pronged response. Uh, again, if you're, if you're new to the forum, this is a great example of the uh, Q&A tool, so you can just definitely use that. Uh, we have a question from the excellent Steve Ehrman, uh, who just published his new book. And he asks, how do your measures attract students to work thoughtfully enough to illuminate their current capabilities? 
Yeah, great, great question, uh, Steve. I want, so one of the key uh, challenges around uh, performance assessment is motivation. If they're not, if the students aren't motivated to to do 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 well, you know the 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 reliability and validity of the measurement gets called into question. One of the, you know, going back to the academically adrift work, one of the critiques was that um, the reason why students didn't grow on these on these instruments was because they weren't motivated to take them seriously. And the longer they spent in college, the less motivated they were to do something you put in front of them. So the fresh motivated, but by the time they got to be the end of their sophomore year, senior year, they were turned off to assessments and academics in general. And in fact, I hate to say it, from the Wabash study of, of liberal arts longitudinal study, mm -hmm. their measurements suggest that again, the longer students spend in college, the less academically motivated they are. Mm. It's a ter you know, a, a really, you know, if you're an edu a committed educator like myself, a really challenging finding from that Wabash study that uh, you know, really, uh, we need to do a lot, a, a lot of thinking about how academic engagement is structured and student is seen as relevant and, to students and motivated. That's a <clears throat> a long-winded way to get back to uh, Steve's question. So, um, one is kind of on a basic level: how do you get them to do these surveys and assessments in the first place? Uh, we provide uh, some limited economic incentives for students to take these surveys, something like $50 for the year to take the surveys and the performance assessments. For the ones that are doing every, the weekly surveys and the experiential samplings, they're signed up for an independent study course. And so they get a court, they get course credits, essentially one class over the, over spread out over the year to engage in these, uh, 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 surveys which are really about reflecting on their own education uh, and so they're motivated in that way. Finally, in terms of the performance assessments themselves, I can't say this about the off-the-shelf critical thinking measure, the heightened measure that we use from ETS, but the ones that we co-designed with ETS and uh, the online civic reasoning assessment that we uh, um, borrowed from Sam Weinberg at Stanford, mm -hmm. those tasks are very engaging. The tasks themselves are kind of very engaging and motivating. So, you know, you're put into a group and you're saw, you know, which of these three candidates should we hire? Here's some information on them, interact with each other. It's, 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 a, it's an engaging task. Uh, thinking of yourself in a, this complex social scenario, enga again, en engaging confirmation bias a little bit less so that that task uh, but the online civic reasoning is you know uh, I don't want to reveal the items but again quite engaging you can imagine yeah. uh, scraping the uh, the social media to to get a sample of what's out there and then asking students about reliability and validity it would be hard for that task not to be engaging oh, that, that, that sounds like a lot of fun a bit of role play. Um, friends, we, we have more questions coming in, and uh, thank you for that one. And uh, kind of building on that, we have one from uh, James Garcelon, excuse me, Ray Garcelon, um, and he asks, do you think there are any useful strategies or guidelines to effectively integrate external measurements of student success as a part of a holistic system of student learning, i.e. a nursing program? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, that's great. I mean, I, I've... Uh, I think a lot about that, Ray. Also, uh, you know, in my uh, in my day job as a dean of an education school, we have a teaching we have a, uh, a teacher education credentialing program where the there's always an interest to see not just how are they performing in the program and the competencies that they're developing in the program that are assessed there, but also to track them into their jobs as teachers and get feedback from uh, uh, the districts and from the field at, at the extent to which they're actually able to engage that work. Uh, so I think it's a very useful thing to do in general. 
where we are in the project, um, we're going to get to some of that in the next two years. So I mentioned we started data collection in fall 2019. The design of the uh, the, the design of the study was uh, that the 1,200 students in the sample that are with the extensive measurement, they are uh, half freshmen, yeah. half juniors, yeah. half a, a, some of those juniors, essentially half of the juniors, a quarter of the sample, continuing juniors, they had started at UCI as freshmen, yeah. the other quarter are junior transfer students. In the UC system, for every two entering freshmen, you take one junior transfer student in, primarily from the community colleges. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we've got, if uh, one way of saying, from that fall 2019 cohort, roughly half of them were juniors. They are graduating, the ones that are graduating on time, will start to graduate in May this year, sorry, June this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are, um, uh, the Mellon Foundation has invited a proposal from us that at the June board meeting they'll decide on, so I don't want to get ahead of the foundation, but uh, if all goes well, we will have two years of additional funding to track those students after college into uh, uh, the labor market, into grad school, into life. Wow. Because, it, you know, College is not just about labor market outcomes. It's about a broad set of human development. And so we want to, we should really be interested in how they are uh, faring in uh, uh, after, after graduation in terms of, you know, broad set of, of, uh, 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 of, uh, of outcomes. Uh, in terms of human development and, and general flourishing, well-being, general well-being. Uh, that's a that's an ambitious answer. I, I really want to see that go forward. <laughs> ambitious project. So let also let me be clear. I haven't had a chance to say this yet. Yeah. You know, it's not just me, Brian. You know, so we've got a, a gr an interdisciplinary group of uh, uh, working on this uh, project at UCI. There's 12 faculty involved, leading re, uh, 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 people from developmental psychology like Jackie Eccles. She's the foremost national expert on student motivation. Mm. She's very involved in designing our surveys, taking a leading role in that. We have Mark Warshower, National Academy of Education on Ed Technology, guiding the learning management systems analysis. We brought in um, uh, three dozen leading experts in the country for convenings at UCI prior to data collection to advise us on developing this measurement system. So let me assure you this, Brian, if, if this wasn't left, left up to just a sociologist like me, because I, you know, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have the ability to kind of put in place the, the, a comprehensive project of this character that's really interdisciplinary yes. in, you know, at its core. Well, my congratulations to the entire team, which sounds like a swarm uh, of people. Yeah, uh, and I have, you know, and then imagine the doctoral students, and we, we also involve undergraduate research assistants. It's, you know, se se you know, several dozen folks on campus that are actively working on the project. Oh, let me say one other thing about that I'm really proud of. Sure. The undergraduate senate at mm -hmm. UCI formally endorsed the project. Oh. We brought it to them. We said, you know, that we're measuring undergraduate student experiences, trajectories, and outcomes for this mm -hmm. reason. We'd like you to 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 consider it and 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 weigh in on whether or not this kind of work is in the interest of students. And so we, it's formally endorsed by our undergraduate student senate nice. because, again, this is work that every college and university should be doing in one fashion or another. We've got questions that actually address several different parts of your answer. Uh, let me uh, bring in our, our, our friend uh, Tom Hames, uh, who uh, pokes at one of these. 
uh, is this data being used to form part of an instructional redesign process? And, which isn't the same, is this being shared with faculty in real time? Great question, Tom. So uh, it, uh, it, is our, uh, it is our goal to develop um, you know, what you've called real time ways to share this data. Uh, one can imagine a set of, of, of dashboards, data dashboards that uh, faculty could have access to where they were able to observe outcomes generated from our project. Some of that is, is, is indeed happening right now uh, in the following way. These kind of dashboards have, are being set up by our Division of Undergraduate Education uh, using data uh, to inform instructional redesign. So kind of some standard things like where are the, where are the uh, um, uh, roadblocks, courses with roadblocks where students are getting DWIF. You're able to identify those in different majors in real time. You're able to track uh, student outcomes of track uh, a dashboard of what courses students take subsequent to the course to a particular course and what are their grades in those courses uh, and they're building into those systems the measurement we're doing is informing the types of measures they're building into these dashboards so the learning management systems academic engagement measures that we identified are going to be part of that internal data system at, 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 at UCI. So that effort is underway. We're also, hey, I'm going to be the first, the, maybe the only person in higher ed to ever say this. We have the good fortune of accreditation happening next year. So it's a, it's a joke because everyone dread, you know, you know, in, in higher education, don't, you know, people dread having to fill out the forms and all the, you know, the, the exercise. But it's at, at its heart, it's about uh, using data. It should be yeah. to be reflective on practice and improve practice. And so, coincidentally, uh, you know, our accreditation has come due next is coming due next year. Okay. And you know, where if you're a, uh, an administrator at UCI trying to think about where are some learning outcome data is on student experiences to see whether or not we're accomplishing these goals, lo and behold. We've got the state of the art measurement project that can inform that effort and hopefully not, you know, uh, uh, hopefully be used in a way that accreditation is at its best to inform instructional redesign, not just to be, you know, a sham compliance exercise. Ah, yes. Uh, well, what a great coincidence. Uh, and uh, Tom, uh, thank you for uh, a, a, a question true to your, um, your approach to. Uh, education. Uh, going back to the LMS, uh, we have the awesome James Shulman with a question uh, from the American Council of Learning Societies, and he asks, from your early work with the learning management system, what do the prospects look like for deriving measures of engagement that could be built into the various software, and what are the politics of the surveillance issues? Yeah, yeah, so very, um, uh, that's a good very, question. yeah, very good question from uh, uh, James, uh, uh, Shulman and I will, uh, I will take a moment just to out him here. He was uh, formerly at the Mellon Foundation when this project was in uh, early design stages, and so uh, he he um, uh, helped inform kind of our original thinking about this project and uh, uh, engaged the foundation in consideration of it. So I'm very grateful for. His his prior efforts and his ongoing interest in the in the in the project. Um, so uh, it our our intent again. It, so our original project goals were to improve measurement. Uh, I mentioned uh, around institutional improvement at UCI. I mentioned uh, informing larger social scientific knowledge generation. But a, another goal of ours always from the start was uh, developing innovative measures that could be disseminated throughout higher throughout the field of higher education more broadly. So yeah. in the case of the LMS data, right, 
at UC, I mean, it was a, it's a, it was a major lift for us to make sense of that clickstream data, right? Every click that a student engages in, in uh, the LMS system, we had to, I don't want to get too technical here, but we had to purchase, you know, space on this huge Amazon web service server mm -hmm. to park all this data so that you can analyze it in, you know, it would just, it would have uh, otherwise just overwhelmed even the, the data, the computing systems of a major uh, research university. And then you had to have the scientific expertise to code it, make sense of, of again, to, to translate all this big data noise into coherent measures. So we were able to do that at UCI because of a lot of our research capacity at, at the at the campus. Mm -hmm. um, we um, uh, but every college and university in the country certainly doesn't have that ability. Mm -hmm. You know, UCI, we're, we're, we're kind of exceptional. It's a major R1 university. It's also uh, as a dean of the School of Ed there, I'd be remiss to not say that it has a great school of education ranked 15 nationally as of as of Tuesday this week, uh, okay. the seventh best public school of education in the country. Okay. Send, send PH, your potential PhD students our way. Uh, so back to the LMS system. It's uh, we were able to generate this data, but not every campus can do that. The way to do it at scale is there's three major um, LMS providers that control 90% of the of the of the market market, and so it's very it would be very low cost for them to take measures that have been scientifically uh, generated and validated in our project because we've got this data we can triangulate it and make sure. Uh, uh, we're identifying things that track with other measures of academic engagement and the like, and then build them into the systems and automatically provide them to other colleges and campuses. So that is our goal. We're still, you know, honestly, we're still, you know, we're barely 18 months into data collection, the pandemic, you know, created opportunities for us, but also challenges. Sure. So uh, I'm really proud of what the team's generated so far, but we haven't yet gotten to the point of of, of uh, identifying measures that we would recommend be provided for the field as a whole, but we are going to get there. And uh, uh, yeah, so I think that's, I think that's, um, uh, um, that's, uh, I think that's, that's, that, that's a, a coming. We haven't lost sight of that. Now, James also raised the issue of the surveillance data. Like, what if faculty, you know, like, what do you mean you're measuring academic engagement in my class? Uh, that seems a little, uh, you know, a little creepy surveillance. So uh, the, I'd say two things around that. One is, we have to have real conversations about what is the purpose of measurement. Mm. We have to say loud and clear, it's not about accountability, right? That's, you know, we know from K-12 that attempts to use measures that are imperfect and limited to enforce accountability on sc schools and K-12 teachers has been disastrous. It's been counterproductive. It wasn't scientifically uh, justified in the first place. The measures weren't able to do what uh, um, some well-intended stakeholders thought they were doing, enforcing these accountability regimes. So measurement can't be about that. It's got to be about something else. It's got to be about using it to intentionally design programs to better serve students. And so one is, you know, let's be clear about what the goals are and the, the goals we can share and agree on and reject those that we, that, uh, uh, you know, are, are, not, are not useful ways forward. The other thing I would say is you, you build into 
the system safeguards so that individual privacy is maintained. So all the data we're using at UCI, by the time any researcher, including myself, gets a look at the data, it's been de-identified. There is a person, a, a, a literal individual hired uh, for the project that takes the data from the system, merges data together in different strands, but de-identifies it. So by the time a faculty or a grad student or a researcher gets to start working on it, it's it's not it's not identifiable down down the road. And so so again, I think there's ways operating procedures to protect privacy, uh, to allay some of the fears of of um, faculty worried about uh, uh, too much surveillance. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, then I think we have to be really clear about the purpose and value of the measurement. And then I'll say one more thing, you know, like, you know, we have to put the students, for, we have to put students first. We have to put st yeah. the needs of students first. The, yes. the you know, 50% of students starting uh, college in the US don't graduate in six years. It's probably a little bit, probably closer to 40, 45% today. But come on, there's no other sector in this country yeah. that could, would tolerate that level of underperformance year after year, decade after decade, and not engage in a broad scale social movement to do better by those to the students. And so part of doing better is to take student experiences seriously and use this measure for good in ways that are uh, ways that are uh, good and can help us address these kind of problems of student success, retention being one of them, but holistic development and growth, uh, uh, you know, another. Here, here. Uh, James, thank you for the great pair of questions. And again, thank you, Richard, for the very, very deep and passionate answer. Uh, we have we have one quick question, a uh, clarifying question from uh, an awesome person, and then we want to hear about your findings. Um, so this is from uh, Roxanne Riskin, longtime friend and supporter of the program, who says, during the two-year tracking, student mood is mentioned. Can you talk about how a student's mood will be tracked and how this information will be used to help students during the two-year study? Hey, great, great, great. Well, that'll get that gets us into some findings. So uh, thanks for that question. Um, so when you use the term mood, I, you know, it, I, I think of our experiential, the best data on that is the experiential sampling where we ask about emotions, right? What mm -hmm. are you doing? Who are you doing it with? What's your emotional state? And, uh, and so your, that data is, you know, really captures mood in real time lived experience. It's not retrospective. How did you feel last week? It's how are you feeling now? 50 times, remember, they're they're asked 25 uh, one week, 25 another. Uh, interesting. So here's a finding. I'll throw out my first finding for you for the for the group. We had the um, uh, by accident more than design. We we deployed this experiential sampling method last year in February and there was no pandemic. So we had a people, uh, you know, there was for people following the news, you know, there was some concern about a looming thing, but camp in Orange County where we were, there was uh, li literally a handful of cases. No, never, no case on campus operations. And so we have people's, what are you doing? Emotional state, they're all on campus. They're all feeling pretty good, <laughs> hanging out as undergraduate students. And then th we asked them again in April, mm -hmm. experiential sampling. Mm -hmm. Ooh, a lot happened in March. There, the, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic. President Trump de declared a national emergency. The governor of California issued uh, st uh, stay-at-home orders statewide. The campus uh, uh, essentially moved to remote instruction and told everyone they should go home out of the dorms. 
So what's their, what was their mood? What was their emotional state after? Hypothesis, right? They were, a lot's changed. They're worried, they're concerned. Turns out it was, it was remarkably stable, remarkably stable. We had very little emotional changes in emotional uh, mood before and after. And, uh, you know, you can, you know, social scientists were really good at post hoc explanations. Well, maybe it was still too early in the pandemic. You know, they went, you know, they were back home with their family that they had some, you know, resiliency, around, you know, around because of that. Okay. Uh, who knows? But but the, the, the empirical fact is their emotional moods changed very little. Interesting. Now, the mood is different from we also track uh, psychological stress, mental health issues with more a standard battery in the social, the social surveys they get. Stress does increase during the pandemic. Uh, uh, it, it was particularly elevated in the uh, spring term right after the pandemic's onset when people move to remote instruction. It's, it's this year it has lowered people's <laughs> this is you know we've gotten more used to the kind of uh, uh, um, the re the realities we're facing so the stress has been lowered but not yet lowered to the levels that existed pre pre pandemic so we, we we look at stress mental health but we also look at the, look at this kind of emotions which is uh, what Roxanne calls moods well, that's great Roxanne uh, thank you so much for the great question, and, and Richard, thank you for sharing that finding. What else? What else can you tell us? What else have you uh, managed to discern from all this? Yeah, so um, you know, I'll, I'll try to come. I'll try to share some surprises, right? Because that's you know, uh, yeah, that, so going into the pandemic, we were uh, uh, we expected, were worried that. Uh, uh, not just about student stress, but students' ability to continue to make academic progress, mm -hmm. their being at higher risk of dropping out. Mm -hmm. You know, colleges and universities have thought for a long time, best way to keep students uh, from dropping out is uh, have them socially em enmeshed in college life, residential facilities, extracurricular activity, the more social in socially integrated, socially engaged they are, the less likely they are to be dropped out. So all of a sudden they're dispersed to their homes. You know, it's hard to do this stuff on Zoom. Many of our students at UCI are 50% uh, yeah, are first generation, 85% are from uh, non-white, non Hispanic, uh, 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 non-white, non-Hispanic backgrounds. So we could many of the communities they lived in were uh, deeply uh, impacted by the pandemic. So really worried and concerned about academic progress and academic engagement, as well as the mental health thing. So one of the big surprises is, in fact, they've done incredibly well academically. The retention, uh, uh, there hasn't been elevated dropout rates at UCI. In fact, the retention, if anything, seems to be improved a little bit. And uh, the grade point averages are up. The credit hours accumulated are up. And uh, our measures of academic engagement, uh, both from surveys and from the LMS system, when we look at the LMS data, we had 15% of the courses at UCI were already online. Mm -hmm. So when you compare those online courses before and after the pandemic, the academic engagement in the LMS systems goes up even in those courses. Mm -hmm. So students academically are, you know, doing are, are doing well, F you know, flourishing and thriving. I don't, you know, I I, I don't want to um, those those seem too flowery the descriptions, but we were worried. A lot of our worries turned out not to pan out. Now, question is, why did that happen? Yeah. So here, this is somewhat hypothesis more than uh, uh, empirical findings. Well, we uh, the the university invested a lot in encouraging faculty to be 
accommodating and flexible in how they interact with students to move whenever possible to asynchronous formats that are much more convenient for students. Mm. Students weren't spending time commuting, trying to get to campus. Students weren't spending a lot of time socializing with, with friends, which can be developmentally you know, productive. And it can also be just, you know, Developly, developmentally counterproductive as well as uh, academically distracting. So uh, these, are, these are some of our hypotheses about why with our particular type selection of students in a particular institutional response at UCI, so I don't wanna generalize this to schools nationally, we saw this, this, this phenomenon. That's enormous. I, I... That, that's, that's that's really striking. And that actually triggers a connection to another question that comes to us from across the Atlantic. Uh, Brian Mulgan, the University of Technology Sligo asks, what if we find that nothing works really well, that you didn't find that, but also, or that these practices only are affordable by elite institutions? Yeah, well, um... That seems too pessimistic for my take on thing. I think th I think my take on uh, on on undergraduate education, and uh, if you go back to academically adrift, you'll see it there. People people like to to uh, to uh, you know people might remember that book as being about limited learning and mm -hmm. all the students we were underserving and i think there's about a third of the undergraduate student body in the us that really isn't academically engaged they're really poorly served mm -hmm. but there is also in in the in that earlier work a sense of what you know of of success and 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 uh, uh flourishing and uh students that were applying themselves and taking advantage of their education and were academically engaged and you know, is that easier to do with more resources? Yes, of course, yes, I would say that resources are helpful, but I don't think it's all, I mean, I, I really don't believe it's only about resources. I think it's about uh, a pedagogical design. Uh, so let me give you on um, pedagogical design. One of the things we're tracked in our, in our study pre post pandemic is the extent to which, uh, students were the percentage of time spent in lectures in their classes right how much of their classroom time was in lectures mm. and boy did that drop going from in person to remote the remote was much more interactive much less time listening to lectures much more time through poor class discussions and and you know connected to kind of uh, uh, practices we you know people call active learning, uh, progressive pedagogical practices. What 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 uh, different different terminology around it, but that increased a lot. That's not a, you know, that's not just about money. That's about kind of intentionally inst instructional design. We all, as faculty, we all love hearing our own voices, and I say that kind of tongue in cheek because I'm talking a lot. Of, in this past hour to you. It's fine. But, uh, it, you know, there's a big disconnect between what we, you know, with us being interested in our own performances and what students are experiencing as learners. And, uh, yeah, I think we can, we, we can, that central insight um, has huge implications for how we redesign programs to better meet students and student needs. Richard, that's a, that's a great moment to, I'm afraid, pause on, um, because we have, we have reached the end of our hour, and I, I hesitate to go further than that, given everyone's commitment, and of course, your time, with the roughly eight jobs that I think you do. Um, um, that's a great note uh, about our focus on students and about what we can do well. Uh, thank you so much for sharing this extraordinary project, and for being so great, graceful as to share your findings right now um, as, as it's beginning to advance. Uh, what's, what's the best way for everyone to keep up with you and with this project? Yeah, so uh, 
I don't do Twitter. I'm sorry. I don't have Facebook, but we do have a web page for the project that you were so gracious to to put, I believe, in the bottom corner yes. of, of, of the screen here. And we're doing our best to keep that updated with findings that we're presenting, papers, the um, media coverage that's been uh, around the project and so on. Uh, and so that's a great place to go to kind of keep up with things. And also people, of course, can email me um, and uh, I'll do my best to respond and be, you know, be resp re responsive and uh, to uh, any questions that came in. Fantastic. Um, well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, good luck continuing this project. Uh, we're really looking forward to seeing uh, what comes from it next. And uh, thank you for uh, thank you for being here. Um, Thanks for having me. Thanks for this great forum you're doing, raising all these important issues with this larger audience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. But don't go away, friends. Let me just point you to where we're heading next. Uh, just to remind you that uh, over the next few weeks, we have some great topics coming up. Uh, ranging from accreditation to educational technology to equity by race. If you want to learn more about that, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. If you'd like to keep talking about this, if you'd like to keep discussing questions like how do we measure student learning, what do we do with the data, uh, Brian Mulligan's question about their applicability, uh, we have many venues to continue this conversation from LinkedIn, Slack, Facebook, and of course, Twitter. If you'd like to go back into the past and take a look at some of our previous programs that touch on these issues, like last week's session about data analytics or previous sessions about student engagement, pedagogy, the LMS learning design, just head to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. We have about 249 videos there. And before we go, let me just thank you all for a stack of really good, very thoughtful, very probing questions. As always, it's an absolute pleasure to work with all of you and to think with all of you. I'm delighted the forum can be this kind of base for all of your thinking together. But even more than all of that, please take care and be safe, all of you. We'll see you online next time. Bye-bye.